Hey, everybody, and welcome back to our study group studying uh, Peter Adamson's A History of Philosophy Without Any Gaps. Today, with me, Nadalin Klebs, uh, we have Rogerio Marquez of Awaken Consciousness and Graham Pong. Welcome, guys. Thanks for joining. Hello. Thanks for having us again. Yeah, to, today we're discussing episodes seven and eight of the Europe series, and we'll be talking about Parmenides. Uh, Zeno of Elia and Melissus of Samos. I hope I got that right. Did I get that right, guys? <laughs> Thank Those are the guys. Yeah. Sometimes together referred to as the Eliatics, I believe, because uh, Zeno was from Elia. Uh, Parmenides, too. No? Parmenides was from Elia as well. Yeah. But. Um, and so Melissus. Melis Melissus known as Samos. yeah just because but he... but he we don't know for sure maybe he traveled from samos uh in during his life and uh, established or flourished in ilia uh, which would make sense since um the master would would be in ilia yeah so he gets group also called an Eliatic because he's a a follower of parmenides right yeah. So we, we can also show uh, a little bit of uh, geographical context briefly uh, to um, to help viewers uh, see things. So uh, as usual during this these uh, episodes, since the first one, we are discussing the um, Eastern Mediterranean that includes uh, mainland Greece, uh, the Italian peninsula, Sicily, um, and the w uh, western uh, coast of Turkey. Um, and as we've mentioned, Ilia is uh, situated uh, on the uh, front side of the boot of Italy, as one could say, while Samos is more or less close to the western coast of Turkey, and it is a, an um, offshore uh, island, uh, a large uh, major island, from which also um, Pythagoras, previously discussed in, in uh, the last episode, also hailed from. Uh, and we are uh, speculating that Melissus might have uh, been born in Samos, since he's named Melissus of Samos, but he might have traveled, uh, even moved from Samos to Ilia, where it would make sense for him to learn from Parmenides um, alongside uh, Zeno as well. And so these are our subjects for today, as Nerdalium uh, mentions. Parmenides being the, the oldest, so the master, and then the, the first student, Zeno of Ilia, a little bit younger, and Melissus of Samos, uh, younger still, um take these uh, dates with a grain of salt things are are um, difficult to um, ascertain for sure uh, from people having lived so long ago but we have a general idea that that they were um, kind of like a generation or two apart each each one yeah all right so for many of these has a reputation as the founder of metaphysics. Uh, uh, Graham, I, I know you like talking about metaphysics. Would you like to to say what metaphysics even is? Just, sure. I, I've, I've, heard, I've heard so many people say and I, I still don't really know. Uh, you're going to get the Graham version of it here. Basically, how I've always wrestled with metaphysics is you know, like philosophy and so much of the basic level is dealing with like everyday life. And that happens within like a, um, a, a structure within a framework. And metaphysics is the uh, area of philosophy that's dealing with the framework on which our experiences are built, rather than dealing with the experiences directly themselves. And that's where you end up with it. You're dealing with like being versus becoming and, you know, much more is that an abstract realm as opposed to, you know, the more real life ones, it's at least like in our tangible, emotional, uh, sensible realm of experience. 
and metaphysics is entirely beyond. How's that? Uh, how does how does the Graham definition work for you guys, Hagen? It looks pretty pretty well, uh, Graham. Um, I, I also had the fortune to talk with a, a, pro, a professor of philosophy um, on um, on metaphysics uh, a while ago, because I felt it was really a, a, a black spot uh, in my um, studies of philosophy. Uh, I was perplexed at this concept after uh, studying a bit of history of philosophy and there being so many uh, systems uh, of thought considered metaphysics. And so um, this teacher uh, called Victor Menezes Sarcia, hailing from, from the Philippines, um, he explained to me that uh, metaphysics is composed essentially of concepts which might have a bearing on reality, but not necessarily. And in physics, things in the real world of physics, material things, there is a set of uh, rules that are much more uh, conditioning or, or, or things are much more constrained. And in the realm of metaphysics, when we are uh, elaborating our uh, thoughts, our concepts, our models of reality, as found in, in uh, disciplines of science, uh, we might have uh, a model that uh, correlates roughly with reality, or it might be even self-contradictory, um, or it might be even detached from reality. A few examples could be um, the theory of gravity, uh, which we must not confuse with the process or phenomenon of gravity itself. There's the thing of physics, gravity, and there's the thing of metaphysics and science, the theory of gravity. Theory of gravity is, is useful because it, it helps to make predictions and probably it does so because it, it correlates, it has a, as people would say, a, a nice isomorphism with how reality works. And then we have things that uh, are self-contradictory, and we will talk about those when we get to Zeno. Uh, hopefully, we can spot some, some contradictions. And then for the example of things detached from the physical reality, uh, we could uh, um, reference uh, fictional universes, for instance, like uh, uh, Star Wars or Lord of the Rings, where some things that would be impossible in, in the world of physics are bent uh, out of uh, um, what would be expected in the material world because magic exists or, or uh, beings or creatures that cannot be possible in the real world exist in that metaphysical world. No, I was going to say just a quick follow up on that one. One of the reasons you may be lacking in metaphysics is it went out of style after um, Bertrand Russell's uh, Barber Paradox and what, how he showed that one. And then the Vienna Circle with their more technical, you know, word driven uh, view of philosophy. System building kind of went out the window at that point. And uh, we, that, that's when metaphysics sort of became a back burner in this in the area of uh, actively teaching philosophy. Tagging on that. Yeah. But as we can conceptualize uh, models of, physic, of physics or other disciplines of science, metaphysics, even though we don't call it that, it's pretty much alive and necessary. We really need to assemble uh, systems of concepts that uh, for our purposes or our benefits, uh, we, we better construct them as useful as possible for our intents and purposes to kind of serve a more or less similar function as physical technology, but at the level of, of uh, metaphysics. Um, and so uh, w one thing that I think is also worthwhile to, to mention about why we are all of a sudden stopping to talk about people from Ionia that were brilliant there. And now we're focusing on, on Italy is because uh, Ionia at this point when these gentlemen uh, were living started to be really um, uh, um, tumultuous because of the uh, Persians uh, uh, ambitions of conquest. 
And so probably these uh, relatively uh, well-off citizens that had means to travel uh, escaped uh, when they realized the, the danger was looming. And that's why now we are talking more about um, brilliant thinkers that are opposite <laughs> uh, to, in respect to main, mainland Greece to, um, uh, to Ionia, to the western coast of Turkey. Um, and so I, sorry, go I, ahead, I just go ahead. had an a, a interesting thought of speculation. One of the things that I'd like to get practice at in this uh, history of philosophy is to try to take perspective and understand the motivations for why philosophers do things. And it just occurred to me when you talked about the uh, the wars and the, the tumultuous times that these thinkers lived in, I was wondering if, so all three of the thinkers we're discussing today denied the possibility of change, which seems like a crazy thing to do and probably is a crazy thing to do. But so uh, they, they did not think it was a crazy thing to do. They had logical sounding arguments that they said is more reasonable than the the thoughts and opinions of typical people. So they considered themselves to be more rational than, than regular people by making these arguments, denying the possibility of change. But so what I'm wondering is maybe the changes looming over them were uh, emotionally problematic. So they were wor maybe worrying. Like, is, is it possible that they were worrying so much about, say, the future of Greece with this looming threat of the Persians that it was kind of an emotional move or at least motivated reasoning to say like, actually, no, nothing can change. Like people are worried about uh, like the Greek culture dying out or like these really scary changes happening. But at, at, in the final analysis, change is impossible. It's, it's all it's all just one unchanging thing anyway. So we, best not to worry about change too much. Do you think that's plausible? Like it's this, um, this argument saying that uh, change is impossible, maybe a kind of uh, emotional denial of the reality of the changes taking place. No, uh, go ahead. One one needs to also realize what kind of tool or conceptual tool they are using to deny change. Uh, they are um, looking at our fixed perspective in time, which is really really constrained. We are looking at time through uh, only at a sliver of time. Uh, maybe even by comparison, even narrower than the sliver of um, the spectrum of light that we can see with our, our eyes. Um, and so it really emphasizes the limitation we have because our, phys our body's physio physiology is um, set in such a way that we cannot um, look at time as a, a continuous um, dimension and look at the past and present and future um, in a, a no, non-linear way. We are forced to move through time, um, kind of riding on the arrow of time, and we cannot uh, step down from this, this vehicle in, in, a, in a sense. And so Going back to the reference to um, the film Arrival, the novel and, and film Arrival, uh, we cannot see time as these uh, beings uh, that were created for the story in, in the Arrival, uh, these heptapod aliens that could see uh, all time and at least all time um, in, a, in a continuous fashion. Um, and we are completely constrained by that. But since what moved Parmenides was way above just uh, figuring out how the world works with his senses, he was also using his mind and realizing by, uh, by philosophical thought that if we don't pay attention to the constraint we have in our senses, uh, we can reconceptualize our model of the world to just assume time is uh, another um, constant, basically, that uh, extends throughout being. And although we are seeing only a sliver of this dimension, uh, it, it, ha it has already been uh, completely fleshed out throughout this sphere of being in um, Parmenides' uh, worldview. 
No, I agree. And I, I think um, Nardalian hit on a very fundamental sense. And uh, it's the ideas that philosophers are philosophizing in reaction to something. And, you know, what, what he was bringing up was the social situation of the war. And one aspect I see them definitely going is the idea of whatever, you know, whatever was, even though it's destroyed, it kind of still is. And it's sort of a, an emotional reassurance from a philosophical, intellectual level that nothing changed, even though everything got destroyed. And one of the, the you know, he's expanding on the, the initial way that concept was presented to me back in the day was the idea that philosophers are basically answering each other where the older one is answering the que you know the, the the newer one is answering the questions of the younger one and you can kind of see them leapfrogging each other and taking their, their concepts and saying yeah that's good but here's the problem with it and then the next guy sees the problem with that one sometimes going back and resurrecting a previous one and it seems like it breaks down to, into three categories you have the uh, the philosophers answering each other in that sense on the intellectual level you have the uh, the social level and environment that they, uh, that they need to address the problems facing society at the time, as Nerdalian said. And the other one that you can see in a lot of them is it's reflecting their personal lives. Some things will happen in their personal lives, and then it'll just stamp their philosophy from there on out. So I'm going to tag at that point. Yeah, thanks. And I, I like the point about philosophers reacting to other philosophers. And in this episode, like some boxes, um, Peterson says, well, like we could just get up and go grab something to eat and prove that movement is possible. So it's like, what's the point of sitting around having a conversation about whether movement is possible? That's like a ridiculous thing to do. But then what happened was because these arguments sound reasonable, um, succeeding generations of philosophers took them seriously and tried to find out like, all right, what exactly is wrong with them? What's the mistake in reasoning? And um, at least in, in Aristotle's part, like there's so many challenges in doing that, that he decided to invent a discipline called logic, which would eventually give us uh, computer science and th the means to, to do the kind of talks we're doing right now. And so like if, if one traces some of these influences back, even, even the philosophers who got things wrong, if they got them wrong in an interesting enough way, they often spurred responses from other people that, that turned out to be quite fruitful. And um, Peter Anderson makes the point that paradoxes in particular can be really fruitful ways to teach philosophy, to introduce philosophy. And in this case, actually to, um, to be the inspiration for philosophical research that turned out to be quite useful, even though the paradoxes themselves seem just a little insane, honestly. So basically, in other words, since you mentioned the word paradox, it is unavoidably uh, conclusive that we are going to speak about Zeno now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I'll throw in there that, in essence, paradox is at the base of everything. And all of these philosophers are trying to wrestle with it, whether they realize it or not. Tag. I'll also like to explain, uh, in true Peter Adamson's uh, tradition, that basically all, all these interesting words are from ancient Greece. Paradox comes from para, which means against, and doxon, which means belief. And so in a literal sense, paradox is kind of like a, an idea or a statement of a contradictory belief or a self-contradicting belief. And one of the things I've learned from metaphysics is you can do all the metaphysics you, you like, but if you self-contradict, uh, you have a self-contradiction within your metaphysics, uh, it won't work uh, if it's uh, trying to aim at uh, replicating uh, or modeling what happens in the real world of physics. Um, this is with this purpose, but if the purpose is like a fictional story, people won't take you seri seriously either. Uh, it's, it's as if um, someone writes a, a novel 
and has uh, has a character die and then uh without explaining correctly the, the character just appears if uh, alive if 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 like like if nothing and so self contradiction um people that that creates um metaphysics systems be it for for fi for fiction and and um uh, storytelling or for modeling the world uh, I think it's really important to avoid the uh, uh, contradictions. And, and yet, like these paradoxes, like the, the arguments for them are basically claims that everyday common sense opinions cause people to be in self-contradiction. And so uh, what Zeno tries to do in his um, arguments is to try to show that assuming that m motion is possible leads you into self-contradiction. And so motion cannot be possible because self-contradiction should be ruled out. Um, and he had a he had a bunch of different arguments, and like I don't know if it's worth like going through all of them, but um, I guess the, the the most famous one is with Achilles and the tortoise, and there's a little joke about that one. So I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll let you guys ex explain what the what the joke is a little later. I think just explain the. The paradox so it, yeah you can have, have the little picture up it's good so yeah. achilles and a tortoise are in a race and to make it a little bit more fair to the tortoise they uh, the tortoise is given a head start and so the the idea is that in order to catch up and overtake the tortoise achilles has to before doing that at least cover half the distance or at least make up the distance that the the tortoise um, has traveled so far but then in that same time the tortoise would have traveled a little bit forward and then uh, achilles would have to catch up to where the tortoise was and by that time the tortoise would have moved a little bit forward again and so on into infinity says zeno and because that's an infinite that argument goes on into infinity zeno says um, achilles will never be able to overtake because it's it's not possible for for anyone to do this infinite series to, to complete this infinite series and he says that's a so assuming that that achilles can in fact overtake the the tortoise leads you according to zeno into this absurd notion that achilles can do this infinite task and nobody can do an infinite task i have a really simplified uh, uh, response to this one which is um achilles isn't really um trying to catch the turtle or or enter into contact with the turtle um he is really racing toward his uh, uh end point in life his grave basically and so until he reaches his grave even though he will uh, have to traverse uh, um, subdivisions of of this um traverse he's making in his life uh he, he will probably uh, overtake the turtle really quickly in, in doing so. And to reference the, the kind of Greek inside joke or ancient Greek inside joke uh, that explains the choice of characters here in this scene, in this of Zeno's paradox is Achilles in uh, Homer's Iliad is referred to as light, fo swift footed Achilles uh more than 20 times uh in in this uh um, homeric text and so achilles in in ancient greek culture was really known as this fast guy maybe he was kind of like uh, uh the uh speedster um hero as well not just the the guy that uh um fights really really effectively uh, and the tortoise is an obvious choice, of course, the uh, radiant and uh, slowest uh, land animal that he could think of. He, he probably had the choice between a tortoise and a snail, and he chose this, the, the tortoise because of uh, the tortoise, at least, is more visible to Achilles. Um, and we ha have also an, a more simplified uh, paradox than this one. This, this one is kind of tricky because we have two simultaneous movements uh, so uh, achilles speed which is arguably uh, larger than the turtle speed and they are both moving and if we kind of uh, subtract the speeds between them both it's it's more or less like the turtle is is uh, standing still um, 
and so the other paradox is more or less the result of this uh, subtraction. Um, it talks about an individual at uh, an end of a stadium and he wants to traverse the stadium to the other side. Um, Peter Adamson even used uh, um, a more modern uh, object of reference, uh, a tennis court, uh, because it, it has all these uh, markings. Uh, it has the, the midpoint where the net is. And between each of the sides, there's also the uh, serving uh, line. And so th by default, this object is already divided into uh, four nice, nicely divided uh, sections. Um, the tennis player wants to go to the other side. He, he will probably find the net in the middle. But before doing so, he must uh, reach the, the net. And before reaching the net, he must reach the, the um, serving line. And before the serving line, he must reach the imaginary line between the starting point and the serving line, and so on and so forth. This can go on and on and on. And Zeno kind of um, has a, an Achilles heel here, as one could say, <laughs> because the entire idea of this paradox and the, the one of the tor tortoise and Achilles is He's, a, he's making a really great assumption, a really huge assumption, which is that the time and space can be subdivided uh, ad infinitum. This might be true in the realm of metaphysics, of which mathematics is part. We have uh, the um, kind of easy to, to uh, wield um, resolution of infinite series of one half, one quarter, one one eighth, one sixteenth, so, and so on and so forth, um, summing up to one, or at least mathematicians, uh, they really uh, swear by that. Uh, but if if we really can subdivide the, the cosmos in um, infinite uh, pieces of space and time, that would mean every single movement that uh, we might do through time and space would need to traverse uh, infinite points. And this means that we, we each of us are mere mortals, uh, beings operating in this uh, physical uh, universe. We would be able to do um, infinite operations, uh, which is something that would mean we are supernatural beings but i don't think so i think we are we are quite uh, limited beings and so we uh, quite clearly do something that is uh, possible within the constraints of uh, the laws of physics and so my my uh, um, suggestion to um, there's also the paradox of the arrow in which uh, Zeno fleshes out the concept of subdividing also units of time. But they, they are all mostly the same thing. He's talking about trying to subdivide uh, infinitely units of time and units of space and supposing that it is possible. And so he kind of uh, um, uh, smirks and uh, um, shows that he is uh, above uh, all arguments against uh, motion um, through, through space and time. And uh, a, a suggestion for the phys physicists that are working in uh, uh, fields like particle physics and quantum physics nowadays is to um, try to prove if, if there are pixels in the universe. And these pixels would need to um, be pixels of not just time, but uh, not just space, but time as well. Um, and so there's arguments for, for this, um, which is we know from quantum physics that energy is quantized. And we, if we conceive of the smallest packet of energy that is quantizable according to the rules of quantum physics, which is, is uh, super known for being uh, the branch of physics of uncertainty. But in all this uncertainty, one thing is certain so far in quantum physics 
energy is quantized, which gives the name to the, the, the branch of physics. And so if energy is quantized, and according to Heraclitus, we use energy or fire as a mean of currency to do operations. And movement arguably requires energy or kinetic energy. And so if we try to simplify movement to the fundamentals, to, uh, for instance, photons traversing uh, space through time with the, at the light speed, so traversing the, what we call the void, um, these photons would need to do operations. Uh, if space and time is infinitely divisible, infinite operations. But as I argue, probably they are traversing uh, uh, um, dis discrete uh, or pixel dis discrete units of space and time or pixels, and so each pixel is kind of uh, gating the um, um, photon, asking the photon if he has enough energy to go to the next pixel um, in the unit of time that is demanded for such uh, a packet of energy. The, the photon uh, shows that it does have that energy. And so it moves to the other uh, uh, pixels, to the next pixel, at a rate that is consistent with the speed of light. And since the uh, amount of energy that a photon can have um, is, is quantized, uh, it could help explain uh, this constraint, a w really well-known constraint of, of light speed, um, of, or at least the, the maximum speed uh, uh, that light can traverse. Um, and so Aristotle kind of tries an, a, a similar appro approach, but he, he didn't have uh, the benefit of um, inspiring himself with um, uh, the, the ideas or the uh, breakthroughs of quantum physics, general relativity, uh, the observations uh, that we can with uh, our uh, more advanced in instrumentation. Uh, he tried really roughly to argue that if you try to divide or subdivide units of space really smaller, you will also subdivide the time it takes for the object to traverse it. And so he kind of shows like with a cop out that uh, you can um, you can still have movement even even if you try to subdivide things as small as possible and so yeah this is kind of like the approach i would have to try to to destroy uh, zeno's zeno's viewpoint but having said this this doesn't disprove monism we can we can have uh, pixels uh, a universe composed of pixels but everything being uh, part of of one as this pixel grid is a, a grid that extends throughout the entire uh, entirety of being no i was going to say you hit on some key points there and one of the ones that i was going to bring up is the idea that zeno was the first one to deal with the concept of infinite series and I'm sure that would have gotten him to all sorts of hassle with the Pythagoreans because they couldn't even deal with the rational numbers. <laughs> but one of the essence of, I think, Zeno's point of paradoxes is as soon as you start to use language, you're going to start to have paradoxes a lot arise. And it's very much a, a relationship between words and words trying to represent reality, sort of the, the map territory uh, relationship. And it seems like he's very much, all of his paradoxes emphasize around the parts versus whole conflict, where the how do the parts assemble into this whole? And he's pointing on the, uh, again, in math is sort of the, the continuum hypothesis. You know, how do you go from points to a continuum? You know, into a continuous line segment versus how does it compose the points? And this is very much Zeno is the first one that's really kind of breaking that down on any sort of uh, fine, fine, fine scale uh, saning. And that's where he's basically developing his paradoxes from. And he's basically, again, I see him as more of a more formalized technical version of Heraclitus where Heraclitus was bringing that up in like one word or one concept with like the river, where you had the, the whole and the parts all contained in there, Zeno sort of separating them apart and basically shoving them in the face. 
and using kind of a, a sense of a Parmenides uh, monad, is, you know, and some of the conflicts that that produces to do this. He sort of, you know, this I see him reacting to Parmenides monad that way. So going to tag on those points. Yeah, I, I was I was thinking one line of thing while listening to Rogerio, and then the continuum hypothesis I got me trying to remember is is that related to the axiom of choice or whatever? Like I'm. I'm not actually that well versed in that that level yeah, of mathematics. Co continuum hypothesis is dependent on the axiom of choice, and it was the idea of the ax. You know, again, that's the whole. Godel was this the axiom of choice, true or false, sort of thing. And it, now you're into way more technical stuff. <laughs> yeah, the more, more technical stuff than I've uh, mastered, but I have read some about it. Um, yeah, so I, I guess when I was, I'm trying to remember what I was thinking about when I was listening to Rogerio, because I quite like that, but I'm, I'm distracted by math now, Sh shiny math. Um. <laughs> but math is conceptual. It is um, a system that we have that uh, is a science of patterns, a science of interpreting the patterns of the reality in many, many different uh, domains from number theory to series, arithmetics, geometry, so, so on, long and so forth. So many branches of mathematics, uh, almost uh, also endless. Um, but uh, they are conceptual because uh, although the cosmos is, is um, uh, self um, it, it, it is uh, not not contradictory. It's not self-contradictory. It's self-consistent. At least f until now, we have always figured out uh, 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 a way to explain our observations that kind of drive the nail that the universe is self con is self-consistent. But math can easily be uh, self-contradictory if the theorems aren't really proven correctly enough. If if the um, there is no not a, a rigorous proof, and that's why mathematicians really prize um, really correctly proven theorems. If the theorems are are kind of half baked, uh, mathematicians the seriousness that they take with some some of these uh, half baked uh, theorems is much lower than than the really uh, formally proved theorems yeah so I, I, I one of the things i was thinking about is um this this move by these metaphysicians to mm -hmm. rely only on reasoning to try to to talk about the world and then completely disregarding uh, sensory data or the experience of the everyday world when that would seem to contradict their theories. Uh, oh, and this is this is that line I thought I was going on. Um, whereas maybe different to a lot of other traditions in the world, what they did do is is also move away from the authority of the teacher. So and kind of stick to the authority of the arguments. And that's one of the things uh, Peter mentions earlier about the pre-Socratics and what makes their work philosophical is that they do have this res respect for argument, maybe too much respect for argument, um, but that's a different kind of respect than the, the teacher said so, thus it is so, uh, which in other times and other places is very much the, the way things operate. And even these days, I, I know some, some smart people who would place the opinion of a teacher above reason and evidence, or even a combination of reason and evidence. Yeah, that, uh, that is a logical fallacy uh, appeal to authority. And it, it, it is, uh, well, um, it, it might produce contradictions. Um, authorities are fallible humans. Not, they, are, they aren't supernatural perfect beings. And so uh, as being fallible, um, in between the wisdom that they might uh, bestow upon us, there might be something wrong that if we take take all their they're saying uh, as uh, consistent with reality uh, and skeptically uh, without uh, filtering these things with some kind of method uh, 
uh, we might find ourselves also espousing uh, beliefs or models about reality that don't don't correlate with with how reality works. No, you beat me to it with the uh, with the. With, oh, I lost it there. Sorry, Rogerio. <laughs> I, I would probably. Yeah, if I if I may, I, I would also like to um, widen the concept of appeal to authority because by uh, referencing uh, and criticizing the depictions of gods, as we've talked uh, when we discussed Xenoph Xenophanes, um, the the gods are kind of like uh, authority figures as well, um, and they were being considered as influential um, characters that dictate how to proceed and how things work. Uh, what are the norms? What are the rules? What are what is ethical and moral and what is not? Um, and so if you have a public uh, that is uh, taking these authority figures words for it, re regardless of the authority figures being uh, made of flesh or made of concepts. Um, people, by not thinking things for themselves, they might uh, find themselves espousing beliefs that are um, um, detrimental to themselves, besides potentially being um, contradictory regarding reality or, or co conflicting, conflicting with how reality works. No, I was going to say thanks. You you brought up a much a much bigger point for for me and expanded what I was going to say anyway. You, the the appeal to authority, it's essentially they're, what they're trying. It seems like what they're trying to rule out gradually is they're trying to point the focus to like objective reality, and having the person wrestle with that directly. And the appeal to authority and the logical fallacies are some of the mistakes that one, but one of the, that I got that you were bringing up there is every time you were saying gods, I realized that what you were actually referring to were the things the priests were saying about the gods. And it became a matter. It, it, well, again, yeah, it's the spokesman. And essentially it seems like this is in some ways a political fight too between which one is going to have more authority in the society, that the priest class or the philosopher class, and holding sway on that way. And that's, that's one of the things that, that what you're bringing up there puts a new uh, dynamic that I, had, that I hadn't noticed before in the philosophy, but it makes a lot of sense. I'm going to take on that. Any words for, from that, Nerdalem? Yeah, I, I think I guess my thoughts are slightly at a different place, so maybe a bit of a tangent. I hope not too much of a tangent, but I, and, I'm, and I'm a little bit worried that I said this before, but I'll just repeat myself if I have. I kind of take um, these Iliatics with their with their arguments for why everything is one and nothing changes and no movements possible and there's no space in between anything. Uh, like crazy doctrines that they back up with pretty good seeming arguments uh, as a as a kind of cautionary tale that hopefully should inspire humility it does at least in me so in, in this case the arguments are relatively simple but they're very difficult to debug but the conclusions are quite obviously wrong now, many times in life when we have questions that we really care about getting the right answers to we can also give good seeming arguments and the conclusions may not so obviously be wrong um, or just because the conclusions aren't obviously wrong uh, it may be good to not put too much faith in the in the arguments we make supporting those conclusions even if those arguments seem to us to be airtight like having a truly airtight argument is as it turns out very tricky very difficult and it's easy to make an argument that's not airtight, but that can seem airtight for almost everyone who looks at it for thousands of years before people actually find the like, good ways to, to find the holes. And um, yes, yeah, same, same with authority. And another kind of tangent that I wanted to touch on is that I've also, I've also seen um, this kind of rejection of appeals to authority go the other way, 
where people say, well, it's pointless studying the work of others or counterproductive studying the work of others because they came before us and therefore like we're in a better position to use our own tools. So they, they did give us tools and we have better tools than they have. So we should completely disregard whatever they thought and said and just use the tools we have to find out for ourselves. And um, I think that goes a little bit too far as well. So rather than then make our predecessors or our ancestors into these ultimate authorities that can possibly be wrong. We can study their work and accept that probably there are some mistakes or like definitely there are some mistakes somewhere and know that it's not an infallible source of wisdom, but it is possible to learn from it nonetheless. Same way as reasoning is not an infallible source of wisdom. It's possible for reasoning to be incorrect. And there's all other kinds of reasons why reasoning may be correct, but the the premises may be incorrect. So the starting assumptions may be incorrect, even though the reasoning following it, that may be correct to say that maybe reasoning shouldn't be put on a pedestal as well. But similarly, people can go the, the other way and say, we we'll take that too far and say like no point in reasoning ever because reasoning is useless. You're never going to be sure you're right. So you might as well listen to the priests who get their knowledge from an infallible source, some kind of a God or whatever. Um, and same with even empirical evidence, like all of our, all of the experiments we do, um, also have, um, have the assumptions and, and limitations. So they're, they're not infallible sources of, of knowledge experiments and, and observations. Uh, but that can be taken too far and said like no, no point in doing any observations or experiments. Like all we need is to sit and reason about things. We'll find the truth or all we need to do is uh, trust the priest's version of the word of God, and then we'll be fine forever. Um, and, and maybe there is no, actually this is what I think, but I, I don't, I don't know it. I, I just, I just think this, that there's no one place we could go to, to get really certain knowledge um, that, that'll never fail us. I think even the scientific method sometimes fails us. Uh, any kind of philosophy method sometimes fails us. And maybe more controversially, sometimes religious things work <laughs> in surprising ways for surprising reasons. Uh, but yeah, that also sometimes fails. So yeah, I, I think there's, it's, it's to me interesting to like in, instructive to look at these examples of seeming good reasoning leading to really absurd notions. And then taking that to like people making political arguments and the, the reasoning also sounds good, but then like the conclusion maybe shouldn't be taken as 100% certain just because the reasoning sounds sounds good like this. The reasoning can easily sound good and conclusions be completely wrong. If I may attempt to um, encapsulate uh, your ideas, the first one is think for yourself. The second one is take authorities and your senses your sensory input with a grain of salt or or some dose of skepticism um, and the other is look at authority figures your senses entire doctrines uh, cultures systems of belief sages not as bearers of the truth or um, any entities that can possess the truth, much less have exclusivity on the truth. But at best, if they have some merit in what they have been doing, as fingers roughly pointing at the truth. And so, and this is a really important uh, concept, this last one, this last metaphor that I draw from uh, Taoism, uh, the words from Lao Tzu, and also of Siddhartha Gautama. I'm not sure who came up with it first. Um, but I think it's really, really important to, to know what truth is. It's something that is out there because the universe is, is there. It is, like, like Parmenides <laughs> repeated instant, uh, uh, so many times in his, his poem. It is. But do we, can we, are we grokking this it is? Probably not, and probably we never will. And probably even the most uh, wise authority figures, 
the best uh, instruments of, of science and technology that we uh, have devised and can devise probably will never um, in, encapsulate this truth, uh, definitely. And so what we can do as rational beings and also possessing uh, some limited senses is try to use what we have with some moder moderation without going to the extremes of saying senses are completely useless, experts are completely useless, or the other extreme that saying everything our senses tells us is correlates with the, what the world is really about. And also assuming that we can just uh, stop thinking and, and let, let authority figures and experts think for us. So we, we really need to figure out uh, to how to strike a balance and to distinguish between tools to inch us closer to the truth and gather piece, bits and pieces of the truth uh, from the truth itself. No, I agree 100%. Some of that, I think it, a lot of that is uh, summed up in one of my pithies, and that is don't trust yourself trust others even less <laughs> that you know is, uh, I, but ultimately you have to trust somebody so you got to make your pick and it's just that, that that's my sequence is you know and that recognizes that you're always going to be wrong about something but ultimately the choice falls onto you so if you pick the wrong expert to trust that's still your mistake for picking the wrong expert tagging on that if I may, I would also like to comment on, on this idea that older ideas are necessarily wronger than more recent ideas. Um, <laughs> one, one can uh, just uh, admire how potentially foolish that is, considering how many times uh, civilizational apocalypse has happened. Uh, <laughs> uh, we had the fall of the Roman Empire and then uh, people picking up the bits and pieces uh, of fragments of philosophy and other other technology uh, technology sch schematics and whatnot, uh, and many things being lost. Like we lost the know-how how to do plumbing when the Roman Empire fell, and also we lost we lost this technology previously in the um, Ganges Basin civilization. Uh, when uh, this 5,000, supposedly 5,000 year old civilization uh, also uh, uh, had a, uh, an apocalyptic event and uh, uh, they, they lost their uh, records or somewhat. And so progress isn't always necessarily um, in the direction of moving forward. Um, we, we aren't necessarily just accumulating valid knowledge we uh, in our progress might lose a lot of treasures and we have just to give you guys a sense and who is watching i've become startled with the realization that of the more or less 100 plays that sophocles wrote we only have like seven or six and a half of all the 300 or so books that um, Epicurus wrote, this brilliant mind of the Hellenistic age, none of these books survived to us. Only a few letters and a few maxims survived to us. Of all the almost 300 books that Democritus wrote, the at Atomist from Abdera that we will be discussing uh, hopefully tomorrow, none of these books survived to us. <laughs> And so uh, it, it's, it takes a huge dose of um, um, hubris to think that we today are wiser than people that lived in the past, not necessarily in all respects. We might have a sharper intellect. Uh, we might have developed our mathematic, mathematics and other branches of uh, science and technology in a way that's probably is uh, a novel uh, to all human history. But in what regards the understanding of um, the underbelly of the cosmos and human nature, we aren't necessarily better off uh, in our uh, societies uh, 
that are drug ridden with benzodiazepines and uh, anxiolytics and whatnot. Uh, people looking for easy fixes instead of uh, going through um, life paths of self-improvement that contrasts heavily with many of these wise people from, from old that emphasized a uh, life of, of, if not complete renunciation to pleasures, at least some moderation in regards to the pleasures and things that feel nice, but emphasize uh, choosing things that are ethically correct in regards to improving character, gaining virtues, and trying to stave off vices as much as possible. Uh, so the, that the individual, since they are unavoidably uh, going through time and accumulating uh, days and years, months and years, which is unavoidable, <laughs> As we've we, I've said previously, we cannot uh, step down from this vehicle that is taking us through through time. Um, at least through this time, since we are accumulating time, we at least accumulate uh, lessons of worth that are are worthy to us. And to broaden this to a whole society or a whole civilization, that the civilization tries to figure out what is essential. And from what and distinguish it from what is non-essential and arbitrary, at least, or um, are, uh, or uh, just uh, nice to have, and even more importantly, to distinguish from things that are really detrimental for the sustainability of civilization on the short, medium, and long terms, and to kind of uh, make a system that uh, prioritizes uh, truths or, or um, systems of metaphysics, at least, that are more creative of sustainability, resilience, and anti-fragility, and giving much less focus and much less attention to things that are uh, only uh, superficial or superficially uh, nice to have, or things that are really detrimental. Yeah. I wanted to say, so today we, um, we came to do this episode to talk about Parmenides, Zeno, and Melissus. And I think we have, and we've spoken about a bunch of other things besides. So it's, it sounded like Graham wanted to uh, respond to you, Roger. So sorry for interrupting that. But like, I think maybe after, if, if you still want to respond, Graham, after doing that, we should maybe... Uh, think about if there's anything else we want to say about these three guys and if not maybe that's a good time to, to bring it to a close today no no that'd be fine i just wanted to uh i, I listening to uh rogerio i was he hearing the counter argument there where the people of, with the that huge presentism bias would sit there and say well yeah look at all those past civilizations they destroyed themselves we haven't yet so why should we learn the lessons that they had that ended up destroying them and you know it's much they they and again bringing it back to what you were saying that's an example of where they can use philosophy to blind themselves and it's it's some of that comes down to the 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 chorus of basically a subjective truth of the group where as long as we all agree that's all that matters and we can just you know focus on whatever short term whatever we're interested in doesn't matter for anybody else and getting bringing that back into Zeno, now we're dealing with the parts in the whole again you have the parts the the, the parts that are separating themselves and causing problems for the whole in the group so I just wanted to bring that back to Zeno since that was the topic. <laughs> Taken. Yes, yeah, so thanks for bringing it back. Uh, we were kind of uh, on a tangent here. Um, to summarize how we could interpret Zeno in both the monist and uh, atomist sense, at least in the sense that we are trying to either show that his paradoxes don't correlate with physical reality, uh, or that they perhaps do. We could say that for a monist interpretation, each particle is connected to all other particles. Each particle or atom, in the sense, the strict sense of Greeks and Greek uh, uh, non-divisible particles. Uh, so each atom is really a thread or a string that pierces through the, the dimensions of, of space and time. 
maybe these dimensions are pixelated or not. Each thread has variations of properties through time, such as energy. And for the atomist uh, per, uh, interpretation is each particle is a defined and well separated point that interacts with other particles and changes its properties such as energy through time. So at, at least if we are looking through the dimension of time and trying to uh, flee from our um, limited perspective through time, the the distinctions between monist and atomist interpretations are, I think, of just details. I agree. From what you're saying, it sounds like they're each is taking for granted the part that the other one's working for. The atomist is assuming that the parts are that the parts are within a whole, so they're going to ignore the whole. And the other side is is the uh, you know Parmenides side is that the whole is you know is one is all that you can really say, and he's just assuming on the part side. And again, now not to go with Zeno, that's where you're bringing in language inherently divides things, where you can understand that part whole intuitively without language. Once you add language, it starts muddling up the mind and such. Tagen. If, if we can, I think it's also worthwhile to say a, a few words about Melissus of Samos, uh, because he is one of these figures in history of philosophy that he is way more than just a, an armchair philosopher in an ivory tower that doesn't interact much with society, uh, like, like so many uh, philosophers that are uh, almost uh, um, isolated uh, utterly isolated from society in, in current contemporary academia in, in, in some circumstances. Well, at least that is the stereotype. Melissus of Samos uh, was an individual of action who led he, people, his people of Samos in a naval battle against the Athenians and won handsomely, according to the historian and philosopher Plutarch. And so he is one of these individuals that I, I kind of tend to praise a little bit more because besides having ideas about how the world works, he, he has been called into action during his lifetime. And if, if he was deluding himself with some of his uh, metaphysics, those delusions had a chance to clash head on with how history works in a more crude sense. Uh, besides, um, Melissus, there are only a, a very scant handful of, of individual, individuals like this that I can name, uh, like Solon of Athens, who was one of the seven sages of ancient Greece, um, um, Lycurgus of Sparta, uh, Marcus Aurelius, Miyamoto Musashi, and also Emperor Ashoka of the Mauryan Empire that was in the uh, Indian subcontinent. So these guys, they are also philosophical thinkers, but they were men of action that either intervened militarily or through uh, governance. Uh, these guys, if, if they really were kind of fooling themselves uh, at first, some of their uh, foolishness might have been revised by their clash uh, with reality. But this is, again, a tangent. To go back to... Um, Melissus, he uh, built built up on um, Parmenides, uh, Parmenides' ideas uh, in a much more non-destructive sense than Zeno had done with with his paradoxes. So very succinctly, um, Melissus argued that all being is unchanging and one, instead of inventing these paradoxes to undermine motion and multiplicity. Uh, he says also that being cannot have started. To do that, it would have to come from non-being, which is absurd, basically mirroring what Parmenides had already said. And But he builds upon the concept of being, from Parmenides being a sphere, by stating that being to Melissus is unlimited or infinite, which is kind of like uh, a callback to uh, Anaximander's uh, principle of the apparent or the boundless. Um, and so he denies that being has, has no limits. 
yeah, so I, I saw a very great similarity between Melissa's and Parmenides, but still the, the willingness to of Melissa's to challenge the teacher, predict the teacher, and say, no, it doesn't make too much sense to say this being is a sphere, because that would imply that there's something outside the sphere, and it doesn't, well, that, that there's a, a non-being the sphere, and non-being doesn't make any sense. So not only taking Parmenides' doctrine, but it, to my I make make it um, more consistent, so, so changes, make improvements to it. And yeah, it was the thing I was uh, pointing at with with both Zeno and Melissa's uh, sort of taking the teacher's teaching, but then using arguments to to build off of it, and in some cases contradict it, and being like, well, we put our faith in the arguments, not the not the teacher as such. And regarding his um, his military career, I'd be really surprised if th the doctrine of monism as espoused by Melissus and Parmenides, and Zeno for that matter, has any practical implication for warfare. Like if, if you have to decide how many ships to have and how to man the ships and what kind of ships and how to meet the enemy and that kind of stuff. Like, like at some point, you, you just kind of go, yeah, yeah, movement's impossible, but we have a battle to fight, so forget about that for now until we f fight the battle. And during like the whole planning of the battle, I, th I think it would be required to take for granted that ships can move. <laughs> and, <laughs> There's and also a really important, a really important, important distinction here about the uh, Athenian um, navy. The Athenian navy was basically equivalent to the U.S. navy nowadays. It was the superpower of uh, the Mediterranean uh, Sea at that time. And so winning against the Athenian navy is stuff of legend for a guy from a small, a relatively small island. Yeah, I would say it, it was the uh, Western, I mean, Eastern European military power. I I'd give some nod to the Phoenicians in the Western part out of. Uh, yeah. You know, I, and um, one of the things that you were hitting on the again tagging on the military aspect, one of the one of the ones that you left out that I would put on there, probably less known as a philosopher, is Alexander the Great. And one of the big areas of philosophy that he pioneered was nonlinear thinking, with the Gordian knot. You know, the the you take the uh, you know. A, basically a tangential approach and just, you know, cut through everything. And I've always kind of viewed him as like a philosopher of action. And uh, a very short lived one. But uh, yeah, <laughs> he, did, I, he yeah. did contribute. Yeah, yeah. He didn't write much of himself. It was more he like I said, he, he it was more in his actions. And I very much see him as, as in the chain of Socrates to Plato to Aristotle to Alexander. And they very much seem, you know, like like the leapfrogging one. And getting back to that one with Molasses here is very much the uh, echoing back to previous philosophers. He was trying to answer uh, Zeno's uh, objections, was bringing up to Parmenides, and was trying to incorporate Parmenides' ones. And then, like you said, one of his big resolutions for that was to reach back to Anaximander and bring in the uh, Aperion. And in a lot of ways, Melissus was one of the first major like system builders where he was trying to build a whole system of thought together as opposed to pointing out little itty bitty pieces like before and basically getting a concept and running with it. And he was trying to have a consistency amongst all the various ideas, sort of a syncretizer is the sense that I get out of him. So tagging. I think that is a really nice um, encapsulating uh, statement on, on Melissus. I agree. Um, and uh, maybe it's a, a really nice way to uh, close it off for today. Um, what are your words, Nedalium? My words are thank you both for studying the series with me. I like really appreciate it. I've been wanting to, to go through this history of philosophy for a long time since I became aware of its existence. Like more than a year ago i've been looking for people to to discuss it with and yeah i mean i'm enjoying these discussions so i'd like to thank you i'd like to thank the viewers for tuning in and 
maybe extend an invitation. This is a kind of informal thing, and we're, we're presenting somewhat to an audience, but it would be cool if we had a couple more people um, participating, interested, even even as guests, for just um, for just on specific parts or specific episodes that are interesting. It would be nice to to get some diversity and some other people, some uh, some fresh people in here. Um, but yeah, let's see you guys uh, tomorrow. I guess that's all I have to say. Likewise, tomorrow good. we will tackle the atomists, the guys that <laughs> like itty bitty things that cannot be uh, sliced and diced. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. See you. Bye bye.